Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video we're going to talk about chapter 4 from the Helicopter Flying Handbook. As a reminder, these videos are going to cover just the things that are different between airplanes and helicopters. So we're not going to cover anything that would be in the Rodman Shadow Book that is also in the Helicopter Flying Handbook, only things that are different between these different kinds of aircraft. So, chapter 4 is about components, sections, and systems. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So the first thing that is discussed in this chapter is the rotor systems, which obviously are specific to helicopters. We don't have those on airplanes. And we have three basic choices. We have semi-rigid, rigid, and fully articulated. So semi-rigid is in some ways the simplest. You have two blades. It looks kind of like this. So you have one blade that can flap up, another one that can flap down. And how does that happen? Well, they have this thing called a teetering hinge. And this allows, you know, this one goes up, this one goes down. You might say, well, why does that happen? Um, if you look at things like the aerodynamics involved, I mean, we talk about things like retreating blade stall, where, you know, if you're going super fast, the retreating blade can stall out. And, you know, part of accounting for that is allowing the rotor blades to teeter. So there's a amount that they can teeter, and we have these things called static stops that will affect how far this thing can go. We have our pitch horn that changes the pitch of those blades. We have our feathering hinge, which is basically just the hinge that allows you to change the pitch. And we have that main mast. So what are some upsides to the semi-rigid system? Well, the biggest upside is that you can park these things in a very small place. They don't take up a lot of space in your hangar. You can just kind of stack them right next to each other. And that's a nice plus. They're also a little bit simpler. Uh, some downsides. If you look at planes, or sorry, not planes, helicopters that use these, in particular the Robinsons, there's a bunch of special rules on the Robinsons, and a lot of it is related to having this semi-rigid rotor system. Things like, you know, if you do a zero G or low G pushover, you can lose your tail, lose your main rotor. You know, it's, it's a really big problem. So if you get into turbulence, you worry about problems related to this kind of a rotor system. So there, there are a lot of downsides, if you will, to this kind of a rotor system, especially when it's on a Robinson. Um, there's just tons and tons of rules. And if you want to know more about that, uh, feel free to ask during our Q&A sessions about that. Then we have the rigid rotor system. So what's the rigid rotor system? Well, mechanically, it's simple. And why is that simple? It's simple because you got these blades that absorb all of these forces. So they bend in order to flap. There's no hinge or anything there. Obviously, you have to be able to change the pitch of them. But if you look at this guy, you notice it says this is forged out of a single billet of titanium. So this is cool. You can do aerobatics in some of these helicopters. If you ever see the Red Bull helicopter doing all kinds of crazy aerobatics that you might see from an airplane, it's because it has this semi, sorry, not semi, fully rigid rotor system that's allowed to do that. Let me back up just a second. Uh, another thing about the semi-rigid system, they tend to use what's called an underslung rotor. And the handbook tries to describe to you how the center of gravity stays in about the same place when the thing teeters. 
And if you think, why is that important? Remember back to the figure skater, right? The figure skater got their arms out and they pull their arms in and that causes things to accelerate and decelerate. And that's going to stress out these rotor blades and also the hub that they're attached to. So the Robinson uses a semi-rigid underslung rotor system. And then finally we have the more common system, something you would find on, let's say, a Schweitzer or a lot of other helicopters. Most helicopters that have three or more blades are going to be fully articulated or rigid. Yeah, fully articulated is much more common than rigid. So if you look at a fully articulated system, it's going to have lead lag hinges, and that allows the blade to seek its own happy place. Let's say it's a three blade system. You would normally think, oh, the blades are all 120 degrees apart, but you know, sometimes you want those to shift forward and back a little bit, and that keeps things in balance. A lot of work is done to get things balanced and not vibrating in helicopters. They have enough natural vibrations that you don't need to add to that. They also have a flapping hinge that allows the blades to go up and down. And again, you've got lead lag hinge and a flapping hinge as well. So that is things that you'll find with different rotor systems. Again, something like a Schweitzer is going to have fully articulated. Sometimes those lead lag hinges are called drag hinges. It's the same thing, though, really. Now, you can have one rotor or more than one rotor. If you have two rotors, you can kind of put them in a tandem location. And why would you have two rotors? Well, you want to counteract the torque of one rotor. That's one reason why you might have two. You can also do coaxial rotors, where there's one on stacked on top of the other one, and they rotate in opposite directions intermeshing rotors. These are not terribly common, but they do exist. How do you control them? You use a swash plate. How does a swash plate work? You'll have the stationary swash plate, and then you have the rotating swash plate, which essentially rides on top of it. So when you move the various flight controls, in particular the cyclic and the collective, it will move this stationary swash plate and that motion gets translated to the actual rotor blades by the rotating swash plate. You see these arms here that are attached, these pitch links. And that's really how that works. It's very simple actually. The other thing that you'll see on every helicopter is a freewheeling unit, sometimes called a sprag clutch. In particular, that's what Robinson calls it. And what does that do? If the engine ever starts turning at a smaller RPM than the rotors, it disengages the engine. So here's a little picture of how that works. So when they're turning together, these little guys are kind of rubbing on both sides, if you will. But if the rotor is turning faster, then this starts to slip. So now they can move independently. And this is necessary so that you can do an auto rotation. If you ever had an engine failure in helicopter, you need the ability to, you know, rotate the main rotor, rotate the tail rotors. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in a previous video. So that's a freewheeling unit. Then we have different kinds of anti-torque systems. How do we keep the thing from spinning around like movies, 
TV shows, you know, before every helicopter crashes, it just starts spinning around uncontrollably. Well, we have our traditional tail rotor. It's very common. So if we have a U.S. helicopter, the blades rotate counterclockwise as seen from above. And the tail rotor is typically on the left side. It's producing thrust toward the right. And that is one system. It's very simple. It does have some downsides, though. So there are some other systems out there, like a Fenstron or a Notar system. So the Fenstron system is basically just a ducted fan, if you will. It's like a tail rotor that's hiding inside of this tail. It's nice because... It allows you to not have as high a probability of people walking into this thing. You see a lot of medical helicopters seem to like this design. Then we have this NOTAR system for the no tail rotor system. And why would you want that? Well, the reason you would want the NOTAR system is that you rob yourself of power. So it might be, say, 35% of your power that is going to the tail rotor. Wouldn't you rather have that on the main rotor? Of course you would. So the NOTAR system uses something called the Konda effect. And you don't have to really understand how this works. You just have to know, like, you know, if you're taking your knowledge test, for example, um, what this is. So how does it work? It takes a lot of the downwash from the rotor and it redirects it and essentially creates like a little airfoil. So here's the downwash. We have a little air jet out the side and it kind of says I'm going to act like a little wing and I'm going to produce lift which makes this thing go to the right and that's sort of free if you will it's like free thrust and there's also some rotating nozzles so there are you know some pluses and minuses to this as well the biggest plus is in the normal situation where the engine is running, it can be very efficient. A downside is, you know, things are less efficient should you be doing an auto rotation. And it's a little bit more complicated. You have to worry about sealing up the tail. And, you know, it's a great idea. It's been around since I think something like the 50s. Um, but you don't see it very much. Okay, and um, then the book talks about things like engines. We got turbine engines, we've got you know piston engines. Uh, of course, they talk about transmissions and how does that work. So typically, you will drive the transmission with belts. Not very often gears, especially with piston engines. And why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. You know, if you think about it gears you can you can get things going wrong very quickly with geared systems whereas there's some isolation between the engine and everything else when you use a belt you typically have a clutch of some sort that will slowly tension the belt as well so you're going to have the main rotor spinning at a certain speed and then the tail rotor typically spins at a much higher speed, maybe 10 times as high. Might not always be that high, but you know, you're you're talking about several thousand RPMs versus a few hundred. You know, typical RPMs for a rotor might be say 4 to 500. That's the range approximately for the Schweitzer if you're auto rotating. If you're driving the engine, it's a little bit less than that. 
other things related to that, you will have some sort of a tachometer. So this here is the style that you would see in something like the Schweitzer, where you have an inner needle that tells you the rotor RPMs and the outer needle is going to tell you the um, engine RPMs. So normally these are superimposed. That's telling you that everything is, you know, connected and that's the normal situation. If you want to practice auto rotations, you need to split the needles and that's something you check before you take off. You make sure that freewheeling unit is working by chopping the throttle suddenly and boom, you know, it will split the needles if their things are working. So here you can see this is about what you would see in a Schweitzer. It's slightly different than this, but you've got the green range. That's when the engine's not connected where you can be. And this is when the engine is connected. You can be here and this is the idling range without the rotor connected. Other things like the Robinson have a needle that looks like this. You've got the rotor on one side and the engine on the other. Notice how small this green range is in the Robinson. Another reason why it's not exactly an ideal training helicopter. Because it has a very tight range. And then a turbine helicopter, you might see something more like this one. Or more of a almost digital representation like this. And here's an example of the split needle where you dropped out those RPMs to make sure that this is working correctly. Different kinds of clutches. Here you have something very similar to the clutch system in the Schweitzer. You have a series of V belts that way, you know, one of them breaks, you're still good. And you've got an upper pulley, lower pulley, and then an idler pulley. The idler pulley is used to apply tension to the system. The newer Schweitzers use an electric clutch, and the older ones will use a manual clutch. So if you're flying something like a CVI, which is the newest Schweitzer, uh, it actually has an automatic clutch where you just say, hey, go ahead and tension that thing all by yourself so you don't have to like pulse it or anything like that the Robinson uses two much thicker belts so there's always redundancy there are some helicopters have a centrifugal clutch where as the thing speeds up it automatically engages the engine to the rotors so that's another possibility. Um, talks about different fuel systems. Again, this is similar to what you're going to see in aircraft and airplane stuff. So we're not going to go over that. We talk about fuel injection, electrical systems, which, again, is covered by Rod's book. Um, hydraulics are not as common of a thing for airplanes. I mean, some airplanes do have hydraulics, bigger ones do. Uh, you might have hydraulics to work things such as sometimes flaps, uh, landing gear, if it's retractable, it's typically hydraulic. Some of the larger helicopters will use hydraulics to make it easier to move the controls. So here you've got, you know, the pilot is moving things and then that gets translated into hydraulic pressure and there's a pump and there's always a reversion system so that if the hydraulic pump fails you can still fly the helicopter so if you're saying let's say you're flying a, a robinson r44 you have to check and make sure the hydraulics are working correctly before every flight so you can try to move the cyclic 
with the hydraulics on, turn it off, and then move it again. And you should be able to move it, just not very easily. And that's true as you get into bigger and bigger helicopters. So the smaller ones tend to not use hydraulics. There actually were some Robinsons, the R44s, the early ones, didn't have hydraulics. Uh, I believe that you're supposed to convert them to hydraulics. So like if you see someone that has a R44 Astro for sale cheap, there's probably a reason. And that reason is most likely that they did not do the upgrade to have the hydraulics put in there yet. And that's something like $30,000 to do it. There's also trim, just like we have trim in airplanes. Some helicopters have trim. The Schweitzer has an electric trim hat switch on the cyclic on each side. And that allows you to set that zero pressure position. The Robinson kind of has a trim. It's, it's not really like a traditional trim system. It's a little knob that you can pull up and it applies pressure so that when you're flying in cruise for a really long time, you don't have to apply as much pressure. The pain in the butt part of that is sometimes when you're trying to release it, it's, it's kind of hard to release and you want to release that before you try to land with it. There are some helicopters that have stability augmentation systems. Again, not so common in the small ones. Autopilot's are very uncommon in a helicopter. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm saying in a training helicopter, you're probably not going to see one. And then, of course, we have the normal stuff like environmental controls. Sometimes you'll see anti-icing systems. You know, you might see an anti-icing system in the engine. And you might see it for the airframe. You know, some helicopters just assume there's going to be enough vibration. So if you started getting ice on the rotors, it's just going to crack off. On the Schweitzer, it's fuel injected, at least the CBI is. And you'll see that there is a little alternate air intake. It's like a little spring mounted door. And it will get sucked open if the main air intake gets closed. So the engine can't get air that way. It'll suck open this little door, which you'll inspect during every pre-flight. And you can still deliver air to the engine so that it still runs. Okay, so that's just a quick summary of some of the items from chapter four. Hopefully this is helpful and I will see you guys in class for our Q&A. Talk to you.